Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steve Zero. Tonight, we are going to go outside and walk in Britain and Ireland. My name is Ben Green, and I'll be your moderator for this adventure. And now, I think it's time to introduce our tour guide and European hiking expert, Cassandra Overby. Good evening, Cass. Hi, how are you, Ben? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for joining us. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here tonight. Where are you joining us from? I am joining you from the town of Snohomish, which is about 45 minutes north of Seattle. It's kind of a small area. We have a farm out here with some chickens and some goats. So apparently I'm a farmer when I'm not traveling Europe. Well, that's fantastic. You're not too far away from me here in Edmonds at uh, the Rick Steves office. It's kind of a cold February evening. What do you have to keep warm? Tea, which is so perfect for talking about uh, walking in Britain and Ireland, since that is my number one tip for that, but I'll get to that a little later. Fantastic. Well, I understand that Gabe also has tea, so somehow I, I didn't think of that, but I do have something very appropriate for where we're headed to tonight. I have bangers and mash, which I'm so excited to dig into once you start us on our travels this evening. That's a waiting for me there, although I would happily take some tea as well. Oh, now, I'd trade these. I'd trade for yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, next time, maybe. And um, speaking of other shows, you've been with us in the past. Is that right? Yeah. Back in May, I did a show on the Camino de Santiago. Fantastic. And if I remember correctly, you said you were going to do some research in the coming summer. How did that research go? So it was really interesting. It was great. It was the first time that I've ever brought my full family, my husband and my two kids on a research trip. And um, so it was three full months of hiking in Europe for this latest book, which is on home base hiking, which is where you stay somewhere for seven to 10 days and do day hikes from there. And so I did pretty much all 40 hikes with my four year old on my back. So I got in great trail shape. That is incredible. <laughs> And what an inspiration. My goodness. Well, I'll, uh, if I ever have kids, that, that is definitely not going to stop me now. Amazing. I'll have a lot of tips for you. <laughs> great, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us again, Cass. We're so glad to have you. Why don't you start us with a few trails? Sure. Okay, everyone. Hold tight. I'm going to get you over to my screen and we will kick this thing off. Okay. Hi. I'm so excited to be here tonight talking about one of my very favorite things in the world, which is exploring Europe on foot. I'm especially happy to be talking about walking in Britain and Ireland tonight. As Gabe mentioned, my name is Cassandra Overby and I am an author. I am also a trail guide. I do all sorts of other things when it comes to hiking in Europe as well. So tonight, I'm really excited to share some of my favorite trails in Britain and Ireland with you. Some of the things I'm going to be sharing include a home-based hiking trip in the Lake District, a village-to-village -village hiking trip in the Scottish Highlands, and also a couple day hikes in Britain and Ireland for those of you who aren't quite ready to commit to a full hiking vacation. So, but first, I think I need to answer the question, how did I even get here and how did I become an expert on hiking? Because this is, this is my favorite thing. It's kind of a niche. So I'm here because Rick Steves and I have something big in common, and that is that we both believe the best way to experience a foreign culture is to get off the beaten path. So for me, I take that quite literally, and that means hiking, getting on the smaller paths, getting out on trail in Europe, and finding your way to the very best small towns, the very best local culture, where people don't speak English, where they don't always... Um, listen to our music or eat our kind of food, but they really are their own people. This is what we're all searching for when we travel, right? So Rich, Rick got in touch with me after reading my flagship book, Explore Europe on Foot, and he invited me for a couple fun episodes on his radio show, and we got to talk about our favorite walks in Europe and how to do it right. And then he invited me to be his mountain guide on Tour de Mont Blanc. And if you haven't seen that episode of his television show, you really should tune in and not just because I'm on there, but because it's a fantastic show full of really big mountains, um, great cozy huts where you can stay and get amazing comfort food and really some of the very best walking in the world. 
So in addition to that, I've taught at Rick's Travel Center for a few years, especially before COVID slowed everything down. And I've been on Monday Night Travel a couple times. This is my second guest appearance. Like we mentioned before, I've been on here talking about the Camino de Santiago. And if you're interested in checking out that episode, I believe the link are in the notes. So my story of why I'm here actually, though, goes back beyond that. And it starts with a different guy, my now husband, Mac. And several years ago, when we were just dating, he invited me on his big dream, his big trip that he always had wanted to go on which was a months long grand tour of Europe. Now I have to explain that when we first met, I had done tons of traveling and I was on a travel break. I had like moved back to Seattle. I was working at a hiking magazine. I was not about to do any extensive travel anytime soon. Well, my now husband didn't even have a passport and here was this big dream. So he invited me to be a part of it. And I finally agreed, I'm so happy I did. And when we launched out on our trip in 2015, because we were long-term travelers, we wanted to do things right and really pace ourselves. So we started to do something that I really love to do at home, which is hike. We started doing day hikes, then multi-day treks, more as a break from sightseeing than anything else. The funny thing is I never expected that those walks would soon become the favorite part of our trip, but they did. The scenery we walked through was jaw dropping. So were the little villages that we came across. And don't even get me started on the amazing comfort food we ate along the way. I'm talking warm sausages, filling noodle dishes, the absolute best of European comfort food. Now, this is a good time for me to tell you that when you're hiking in Europe, one of the best things is that you don't have to pack just the standard raisins and trail mix and all of that stuff. I mean, you really get to look forward to great meals all along the way. Our walking routes took us through ancient ruins and led us to community celebrations where we got to know real people who lived where we were traveling. That doesn't always happen, right? Sometimes when you travel, the only people you really get to know and interact with are other travelers, but not with hiking. It became very clear to me that walking wasn't a break from travel, it was actually a better way to travel. So once we got home from our trip, I started a travel company dedicated to making walking in Europe more accessible. When I wasn't putting together my hikes, there, when I was putting together my hikes, when I was first trying to do this, there wasn't a lot of good information available. Luckily, I speak German, so one of my tricks was to go on German hiking websites and try to figure out good trails and tips for those trails. But not a lot of people can do that, especially these days, not a ton of people speak German. So when I got home, I wrote the book that I really needed and that I wanted to read, which ended up being Explore Europe on Foot. So this book is a comprehensive guide to walking the long trails of Europe. My book has everything you could possibly want to know about selecting the right trail, not just in general, but the right trail for you to fit everything that you're interested in and that fits um, where you are physically. I really believe there's a trail for everybody. My book also covers packing and planning for your trip and training for the trail. I also wrote three guidebooks for specific trails that are mentioned in my big book that didn't have much information available on them, especially in English. These days, I also do travel consultations for people looking for their perfect trail So in some ways, I'm kind of a trail matchmaker. People tell me exactly what they want to do, what they're most interested in, and then I point them in the right direction of a trail that fits all of that. I also help them plan their trips and hire things like luggage transfer, and I lead guided tours. I've done a lot of hiking in Europe, and I love hiking in Britain and Ireland. There's so much to love, and I'm excited to share it all with you tonight. This is the land This is the land of castles, of cozy inns and sheep that are spray painted so people know which flock they belong to. This is the land of tea, that's why I'm drinking it tonight. And getting to drink tea before you walk, while you walk, after you walk, Brits especially love their tea. Walking in Britain and Ireland is a great opportunity to slow down and truly take in everything that's around you. There's no better way to actually take in all of the sites, meet the people, enjoy the food. This is the way to do it. 
And this is actually the easiest area of Europe to start with if you've never done any hiking in Europe. It's really accessible. It's easy to get around with public transportation, so you don't need to have a car. And our language is the same. Well, I have to say kind of the same. Um, in Britain and Ireland, they have things called salad cream, whereas we have salad dressing. And some of their big hiking snacks are made from haggis, which is actually sheep organs. And don't even get me started. You cannot go to a pub wearing a shirt advertising your favorite soccer team. Um, so we have some real differences. We don't really speak the same language and our culture is very different. So that makes it a really fun place to visit. It's not too similar. Today, I wanna to talk to you about some of my favorite trails in Britain and Ireland, but let's pause for just a minute. What exactly are we talking about when we say Britain? People tend to use Britain, the UK, England interchangeably, but actually they're not all the same thing. So Britain is actually composed of three different countries. So you have England, the big one everyone's familiar with, then there's Wales to the West and Scotland to the North. Tonight, we're going to focus on England and Scotland and don't worry, we're gonna bring in Ireland a little bit later too for a great day hike. So I wanna to start tonight with England's Lake District. This is a really wonderful place to walk. It's especially good for home base hiking. So that's what I was telling you about where you stay in one place for a week, 10 days, however long you have, and you do day hikes from there. Home base hiking is great because you can really cozy into an area and get to know it well. You can hike with just a late day pack, so you don't have to worry about carrying everything you own on your back. And you have a lot of flexibility with your itinerary. So if it's a rainy day, you can sightsee and do indoor things like museums. If it's a really beautiful day, you can go out and hike. So you really get the best of everything. This is also a really great way for people with kids to explore Europe on foot, as I discovered this summer when I did it with my family. When you have kids with you, it's really hard to switch accommodations every night. But when you home base hike, then you don't have to worry about all of that switching and you can really just be in one spot. I have a Lake District chapter in my book, Explore Europe on Foot, but I kind of want to take you through some of the highlights right now. So here's a map of England's Lake District. And something interesting to note is that the Lake District is all in Cumbria and much of it is protected as part of a national park. And that is the Lake District National Park, which was formed in 1951. But it's been protected as a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 2017. This is the site of what I call low mountains. So you don't have to worry about anything being too high with elevation. Um, because it's low mountains, all of these hikes are really doable. There are also many lakes that you can see on the map, plenty of small towns to home base in, and lots of hikes to explore. What else can you expect in the Lake District? I will let Rick give you a little introduction of his own. The Cumbrian Lake District, just 30 miles by 30 miles, is England's green, pristine mountain playground. While not impressive in sheer height, England's highest peak is just 3,200 feet. It's long been a powerful magnet for nature lovers. The charm of this area is, in part, the range of experiences it provides. Stumble upon a surprise lake view, then climb over a rock fence to look into the eyes of a ragamuffin sheep. Find the perfect farmhouse B&B. &B. Then enjoy this pack horse bridge. And for a memorable lunch, summit your own private peak for a picnic. This region gives even tender feet a chance to feel rugged and outdoorsy. Here in the Lake District, William Wordsworth's poems still ripple on the ponds. This is a land where nature rules and humanity keeps a low profile. For two centuries, this region has inspired visitors to relax, recharge, get some exercise, and maybe even write a poem. The Lake District is green for good reason. It rains a lot. Experienced English hikers dress smart and don't let blustery weather keep them in. It can be rainy one moment and then suddenly gorgeous. As locals love to say, there is no bad weather, just inappropriate clothing. Okay. 
that's one of my very favorite quotes um, as it relates not just to hiking, but to life. <laughs> There's no bad weather, just bad clothing. So there's so many things to love about hiking in the Lake District. I'm glad you got that live preview or um, the live action where you can actually see what it's like there. So some of my favorite things, um, one of them is you can stumble on some really delightfully quirky spots. It is a quirky area full of novelists and artists and all of that kind of leaks through into the local culture, which is really cool. There are also great pubs for after hike beers or crisps as they call fries. And if you really want to end a Lake District hike in style, you go out for high tea. So high tea, I mean, just having tea doesn't even compare to what high tea is. High tea is this amazing smorgasbord of sandwiches, pastries, dessert, and of course tea and lots of cream. Um, but it really feels more like a meal. And you'll find tea service in every little village that you come across in the Lake District. So I wanna go back to that map of the Lake District again real quick. So whoop. one of the great things about the Lake District is that it's relatively small. So as Rick said, it's only 30 miles by 30 miles. There are lots of towns within this area though, from Windermere in the South um, to Keswick in the North, there are lots of places to home base. You could choose one spot and home base from there and hike from there, or you could experience several of them. So you could kind of hop towns and do hikes as you go. You can take buses from one town to another or you could drive. It's really up to you. <coughs> one of my favorite things to do is to stay in the countryside actually when I'm in the Lake District um, in little inns that are just outside of the main towns where you get really a lot of nature along with the ability to just kind of walk into town. There's nothing like a rural bed and breakfast. For Rick, the ideal home base is that town in the north of Keswick. I'll let him tell you all about it. The town of Keswick is your best home base for exploring the northern lakes, which I prefer to the more commercial southern part of the region. Keswick was originally a mining center, but the slate and lead industries eventually gave way to nature-loving tourists. And in the 19th century, Keswick became a resort. Its fine old buildings recall those romantic era days when big city folks first learned about communing with nature. Today, the town is well stocked with hiking gear shops and pubs. Just down. Okay. One of my favorite walks is actually um, near Keswick. And it's a walk around its nearby lake of Derwent Water. The hike starts in Keswick, and if you're not already staying there, this is a really great opportunity to poke around and discover a new town. That's one of my very favorite things about exploring Europe on foot is that you're not just in the wilderness, there are actually lots of towns to explore as you hike. So from Keswick, you walk down to the lake and you walk in a circle along its peaceful shore. It's a hike of almost 10 miles on a relatively flat path that's well marked so you don't have any worries about getting lost. And it's so beautiful as you go. This hike is also a great opportunity to appreciate the local hills. Walking to the top of one of the ridges above Derwent Water is Rick's favorite Lake District hike. So I'll let him tell you more about it. On the street is Keswick's Petite Marina where we're combining a short cruise with my favorite Lake District hike up a dramatic nearby ridge. Derwent Water is one of Cumbria's most photographed and popular lakes. Boats circle the lake, picking up and dropping off walkers at peaceful landings all along the way. From the dock, a trail leads up along a ridge called Cat Bells. The steep climb both burns off that Cumbrian fried breakfast and offers some commanding views. Vigorous hikes like this are one of many reasons the Lake District is such a hit with English holiday goers. This little adventure takes just a couple of hours and it rewards anyone who tackles it with a trip highlight. Get out and make these experiences happen. For the rest of your life, you'll remember, in this case, scaling Cat Bells with its thrilling King of the Mountain climax. After our descent, we catch the boat at the next landing, 
and finish our relaxing cruise around Derwent Water. So regardless of where you choose to home base in the Lake District, the, ex the scenery that you get to experience is stunning. It's not surprising it has deeply impacted artists over the years, some famous, some not so famous, some not yet famous. Um, these people walk among its lakes and its mountains just like you do, and they take that and put it into their art. One of the most famous artists of the Lake District is the poet William Wordsworth, who Rick mentioned. His Daffodils poem, written in 1804 and beginning, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, you may remember it from high school English, is the quintessential Lake District poem. I'll let Rick tell you more about William Wordsworth. A short drive south from Keswick takes us through the very countryside that inspired England's great romantic poets. The greatest of those was William Wordsworth, who lived here in Dove Cottage. Wordsworth spent his most productive years, 1799 to 1808, in this humble stone house. This is where he married, had kids, and wrote much of his best poetry. In these cramped and simple quarters, Wordsworth practiced his philosophy of plain living and high thinking. The adjacent museum displays original writings, sketches, and personal items that give another peek into the life and world of the poet. His well-stamped passport and his well-worn little suitcase are proof he packed light and traveled far and wide. Notebook in hand, he wandered across England and through Europe on what would become the romantic grand tour. Until then, almost nobody climbed a mountain just because it was there, but Wordsworth did. He'd wander lonely as a cloud through the countryside, finding inspiration lost in the awe-inspiring immensity of nature. If appreciating nature became a religion in 19th century England, Wordsworth was its prophet. The last time I was in the Lake District, I actually visited a spot where Wordsworth vacationed outside of Grasmere, and it gave me some of my very favorite memories of the area. There's a hike that you can do from that inn and from nearby Grasmere um, that Wordsworth likely did during his holiday all the way back in the 1800s. This hike is in my book, Explore Europe on Foot, um, and it's a walk from Grasmere to Easdale Tarn, a mountain lake caused by a glacier. This is a moderate walk of about 4.1 miles, so there's plenty of time to fit other things into your day, like wandering around town, enjoying high tea afterward. From Grasmere, you walk past brooks and down little lanes to get to extensive green fields that lead into the hills. Oop. Having a little... Oh, there it goes. On your way to the tarn, you get to pass sheep, you have plenty of solitude. It's really quite a romantic spot for a picnic, and it's a great addition to your time in the Lake District. Now, while my favorite home base hiking in Britain is in the Lake District, one of my other favorite ways to walk is village to village hiking. It's all about what my first book was about, village to village and hut to hut hiking. And that's exactly what you get to do on my favorite Scottish route, the West Highland Way. Now, the Scottish Highlands are a really magical place to visit, full of history and more of the low mountains that Britain is famous for. Here's a preview of what you get to experience when you hike there. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're packing light, but there's always room for puppies, sheepdog puppies. We're in the Highlands of Scotland. Thanks for joining us. Here in Scotland, the Highlands have more than half the land and only 5% of the people. Still, it's these Highlands, so vast yet so sparsely populated, that give us the classic image of Scotland. The highest mountains in Britain are here in Scotland, in the Highlands. While only around 3,000 feet in altitude, they offer a dramatic welcome and a backdrop of constantly changing views 
for road trippers. Long lakes called locks here cut like fjords into a land where the heritage remains strong. In this region, so much seems proudly Scottish. Clans gather to celebrate traditional sports. Girls grow up dreaming to dance like their mothers did. Whiskey is savored with reverence for the culture. And pipers still stir the Scottish soul. And in this land so steeped in culture, Scotland's beloved Harry Coo feels perfectly at home. These shaggy highland cattle have evolved to fit the environment. Their adorable bangs protect their eyes from both insects and the persistent wind. Historically, highland society was centered around the clan system. In medieval times, long before being tamed by any central government, the highlands were inhabited by a collection of proud and often bickering tribes or clans, each with its own chief and deep-seated traditions. Castles dotting the landscape evoke this strong clan heritage. Scottish people, whether in Scotland or abroad as part of the Scottish diaspora, still relate to their historic clan. And many venerate a particular castle as their historic capital and almost spiritual center. So the Highlands is a pretty wonderful place to visit. Now, the full West Highland Way, the trail that I was telling you about, um, actually runs for 96 miles, all the way from Mungavi in the south to Fort William in the north, and is typically done in seven days of hiking. But tonight, I actually want to talk to you about the most iconic stretch of that hike, the best of the best, which can be walked in only three days, and it's an easy addition to any Scotland trip. The route runs for 37 miles from Bridge of Orkey in the south there to Fort William in the north. This iconic section of the West Highland Way is easy to get to with public transportation. You can actually just take a bus from Glasgow or Edinburgh, and this takes three days to hike. The stages are 13 miles, eight and a half miles, and 15 miles respectively. There's not a lot of elevation gain on this hike, so those mileages are pretty doable. There's also the option to pay for luggage transfer so you don't have to carry your bags if you don't want to. So there are plenty of ways to make this less challenging. The route passes through the countryside and past bends, which is what they call their low mountains. There aren't very many forests on the route. It's predominantly grasslands. Along the way, you have some incredible views of the land around you. This is my favorite viewpoint, a rock cairn on the way um, to King's house. My computer's having a life of its own right now. Um, when you look underfoot, there's so much life around you. It's lush because the area gets a lot of rain. So even in the summer, you can get unexpected downpours. This is a trail where you want to have your rain gear, waterproof shoes, rain pants, a raincoat, and a pack cover. You may not need them, so it's great just to have them in your pack, but you may need them like I did when I was hiking there. One of my very favorite things about the West Highland Way is that it has kind of a spooky appeal and the fog really helps create that. It's like you can sense the spirits that have walked this land for thousands of years. You'll hike past their ruins. Some of them are signed. There's a lot to learn about battles and clans. It's a really fascinating history. As you walk, you come across cozy spots to stop and rest your legs. Many of these spots have fires and cozy chairs for you to snuggle into. You'll understand why they don't want you to, why they want you to remove your backpack and your rain gear. There's a certain etiquette with hiking, especially in this area. The one thing you don't want to remove though, your footwear. Um, they don't want any stinky feet in their nice establishments. <laughs> these spots are perfect for ordering a cuppa, which is a cup of tea to warm up or you can order something stronger. They have some really amazing beers. Um, and like the video said, they also have some really amazing whiskeys. By the time you enter Fort William, the largest town on the route and the one that comes at the end of your hike, you'll feel like you've really discovered the real Scotland. Now, maybe you're not ready to commit to a whole British vacation centered around walking and that is okay. 
I have a couple of day hike suggestions for you. So the first one is Arthur C. in Holyrood Park in Edinburgh. And you can actually walk all the way to this hike from Old Town Edinburgh. It doesn't take you long to get there. And the hike itself is only three miles long, but it's three pretty amazing miles. It doesn't take long to feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. It's a bit of the highlands on the outskirts of the city, and it's a wonderful break from traditional sightseeing. So it's something that you can insert into your morning or your afternoon, and it'll give you a different perspective on the city and the culture. Another of my favorite walks is the Cliffs of Moher on the western coast of Ireland. These beautiful cliffs jut out into the Atlantic Ocean. They're a natural marvel and a must-see if you're in Ireland. I mean, when people say Ireland, they really think Cliffs of Moher. I describe a 6.2 mile hike in my book, Explore Europe on Foot, that visits these cliffs, a nearby headland, and some ruins, but you can also do a shorter walk just around the cliffs themselves. There's parking there, or you can take a bus and you can wander to your heart's content. Hopefully I've gotten you excited about walking Britain and Ireland, but maybe you haven't walked in Europe yet. Maybe you don't even hike in the United States. Never fear, I'm about to share my top tips for exploring Europe on foot. So the first thing I wanna talk about is timing. When exactly is it the best time to hike in Britain and Ireland? So March to October is my, what I recommend, um, but I love high summer, which yes, I know is peak season, but that's when you have the best chance of sun. I also really love the early fall when you can get some great fall foliage. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, how far in advance should you plan your trip? So I recommend as soon as possible after you choose your trail, but definitely at least three months in advance. So there are actually a lot of benefits to planning and booking things early. If you're planning on walking during peak season, like I mentioned, you'll have the best chance of actually getting a room. So this is especially true of a village to village route like Scotland's West Highland Way, where there aren't a ton of places to stay overnight. But even with home base hiking in a nice spot like the Lake District, where there are lots of accommodations, you'll have the pick of the litter when you book early. And there are other benefits to booking early as well. One of the best is that you're more likely to get good deals on everything from flights to trains to rooms. After you have your timing down, you need to decide if you want to hire help. You have a few options. So this is very different from hiking in the United States and Canada. There actually is a lot that you can do to make your route easier if that's what you'd like. So you could hike completely independently. And this is what I do most all the times when I hike in Europe. I plan everything myself. I carry my own bags. I do everything myself. I book my accommodations. Um, but you can also hire a few select services or sign up for a fully guided tour. So one of the best services that you can hire is luggage transfer. And this will probably blow your mind. This is where they will transport your luggage so that you can hike with just a day pack. They'll pick your bags up at the inn that you stayed at and um, deliver them to the next inn that you'll be at on a trail like the West Highland Way. So you don't have to carry your toothbrush or your pajamas or the bag from the cruise ship you just got off of or anything like that. You can really just have snacks in your layers with you. Another really great independent service that you can hire is a taxi, and that can help you shorten daily stages of hikes that feel a little too long or a little too challenging. So an example is, again, the West Highland Way. Say you know you don't want to do a 13 and a half mile day. Say you want to be able to shorten it. You want to do seven miles and then at a road, grab a taxi to your next spot. You can do that. Um, you can also hire a company to provide you with what's called a self-guided tour. And this is really helpful if you don't wanna plan your entire trip yourself. So um, this could be for a home-based hiking destination or it could be for village to village hiking. And it's where this company provides you with the service of booking your accommodations. Um, a lot of times they'll transfer your luggage. They'll provide you with maps and walking directions so that you really have less to book and less to research. The one thing I'll say about that is if you hire a company to plan the details of your hiking trip, make sure you look carefully at their reviews, especially when it comes to walking directions. There are some companies out there that don't update their walking directions or their maps regularly. So you might miss a trail detour 
or, um, or a trail that's gone into disrepair or something that's come up. And when you get there, you're a little confused because your map and your walking directions don't tell you where to go. It's rare, but I've seen it happen. So just make sure that you're really looking at those reviews and also have a backup, have your own maps, have your own GPX tracks that you download off the internet um, to hike. You really wanna do your due diligence when you're walking. Um, you can also hire a fully guided trip. And this is where you don't just have those maps and walking directions, but you actually have a guide with you on trail. That's a really cool option too, because they'll tell you everything you want to know about the local culture. It's not really about the walking. I mean, they'll get you where you want to go, but they'll tell you about the food and about traditions and about holidays. And it's a really cool way to find out more about the local area. Now, one of my favorite parts of getting ready to hike Europe is getting in shape. And I know, call me crazy, um, but I think it's really inspiring because it impacts your daily life now, not just the life that you're gonna have when you're on trail. So I wanna get something clear though. You don't have to be a super athlete to explore Europe on foot. You don't have to make this a super athletic endeavor. You can choose to go slow. You can choose uh, trails that aren't very long. You can do all of that stuff. This doesn't need to be something that's um, physically prohibitive. So you will have the best time on trail though, if you train your body for the specific challenges of walking. So in my book, Explore Europe on Foot, I have a lot of recommendations for exercises, for stretches, different things that you can do to train your body for the trail. That means for walking uphill, for walking downhill, was that, which is actually a lot harder on your knees and your legs than walking uphill, um, for wearing a pack for hours a day, for being on your feet, and for walking several days in a row. So I cover all of these things and give you photos so that you can do the moves correctly, and I help you put everything together with a comprehensive um, trail training plan. But, you know, it doesn't have to be that complicated. Really, the best thing that you can do to get ready for your trip is to actually go out on trail. So I recommend getting out as often as you can and building up to walking for several days in a row. Simulate your time on trail. So if you wanna do three hikes that are about eight miles each, go out and actually find trails in your area that are that same length and walk them three days in a row or choose the same eight mile trail and walk it three times in a row. The main thing is that you wanna be used to the same difficulty level in about the same conditions that you'll get in Europe. That's the best way to, to get everything working, whether it's your gear, your body, your system, um, and carry actual weight in your pack. So I recommend carrying a lot more than you ever wanna carry in Europe. I'm known for wrapping up wine bottles and carrying those to build my strength. This is such a fun thing to do, and it really can help you extend the excitement of your trip. You may just not find that you love um, walking when you travel, but you may find that you really love walking in your everyday life. When I started training up, when I was walking, when I was uh, riding Explore Europe on foot, I was doing a lot of walk commuting. So I would walk the three miles up and down a giant hill uh, to work, and back on the way home. And I did it as training and to perfect my system. And I found that I liked it so much that as long as I had that job, I didn't stop. So it was great. Um, There's so many benefits to following a training program like this before you walk. And it's not just about being ready, uh, but it's about getting to know your body better. So you figure out just what is quirky on you. It may be, you know, that you have tight IT bands or maybe your knees hurt when you go downhill. Much better to find that stuff out when you're at home and you can come up with little solutions than when you're in Europe and um, when it could actually make your walk a bit of a bummer. So now for my very favorite part of planning a European walk, the packing part. <laughs> Um, I obsess about everything that goes in my pack. And that's nice because in my book, Explore Europe on Foot, I lay all of that out so that you don't actually have to obsess about it. Regardless of how much you train and are comfortable carrying, I highly encourage you to travel light. And that's one of the reasons why I obsess about everything in my bag, because there's not a lot in my bag. So one of the very best things you can do to make sure you enjoy your time on trail is to travel light. 
Leave everything at home that you don't actually need with you. Everything in your pack should earn its keep. So if you're smart about the individual items you choose, specifically if you pack a lot of merino wool and stick to a neutral color palette, you can have one trail outfit, one town outfit, lots of crossover layers, and only two pairs of shoes, and be covered for everything from a really rainy walk to a nice dinner at a really can't fancy restaurant. What's more, even with the addition of a few other items you need, your backpack will weigh in at less than 20 pounds. You really are going to love traveling this light, and I guarantee you're going to have a better time because of it. Now, I want to talk for a minute about some of the most important things you'll bring with you on your walking vacation. The first is good trail shoes. Now, good trail shoes are really important. Depending on the trail, I use either low top, lightweight, waterproof hiking boots like these, or European walking shoes like these. You can see how well loved these shoes are. Um, these are mine and my husband's. So European walking shoes have the same functionality as many hiking shoes. They're really comfortable, waterproof, they have great traction, but they also come with a huge bonus. They don't look like hiking shoes. You can actually wear these with jeans and blend in, which I really like. European walking shoes is actually a type of shoe that you can search for when you're looking online at somewhere like Zappos or when you go to a local shoe store. Now, good shoes matter a lot and so does a good pack. This is a great example of what my pack looks like when I do a village to village route like the West Highland Way. So what makes for a good pack for a walking vacation? If you're doing a village to village route, you need a pack that takes into account the needs of both walking and traveling, because this is the one thing that you'll have with you as long as you don't do luggage transfer. So here is my list of must haves. Your pack must have a waist belt for distributing the weight comfortably, really comfy straps, water bottle holsters. This is really important because not a lot of travel packs actually have water bottle holsters. And you need a bag that opens all the way for what I call the inevitable TSA search. Um, a lot of times I also travel with a convertible pack like this one, meaning that um, different parts of it zip off and become other things. <coughs> so on this bag, the top actually zips off and becomes a crossbody bag. And the straps, it has straps that attach to it to make it a duffel bag. So it's, uh, it's kind of the transformer of backpacks, which I like. Now with your shoes, you really, as with your shoes, you really need to train in your backpack as much as possible. So I suggest finalizing your backpack selection at least a couple of months before you travel. Break it in. You want to be very comfortable with this and know all of its ins and outs. Now, if you're home base hiking and doing day hikes, like in the Lake District, you won't need such a big backpack, but it's important to choose something that's just as comfortable and has just um, the same features as a meteor pack. So I always recommend having water and snacks with you, layers that include rain gear and a map. But you can see, I mean, look how tiny this pack is. This is how I pack um, when I'm doing home base hiking. Now, my other essential for a European walk is a smartphone. And I know this is controversial. Lots of people like to be unplugged and you can make the decision for yourself, but I like having a smartphone. Uh, it gives me a lot of tools that I need. And with the things that I don't want, I either ignore them or I remove them for my trip. That way I don't feel completely plugged in. So carrying a smartphone is nice because it lets you get rid of a lot of the other tech gadgets in your backpack. At your fingertips, you are able to make a phone, a phone call to let your accommodations know that you'll be late. You have a camera so you can take pictures. And if you have a GPS app like Gaia, my favorite app, you have up to the second GPX tracks at your fingertips. Now, if you're not familiar with GPX tracks, they're wonderful. It's like Google Maps, but for walking trails, it'll keep you on track. One of the nice things about GPX tracks is that you can actually use them offline. So as long as you upload them beforehand and load them, um, you don't have to have any cell phone service and you don't have to have Wi-Fi while you're using them. So you don't have to run up your cell plan while you're traveling. When you do this though, especially when you have a smartphone with you and you're relying on it with you when you hike, or especially if you use it for GPX tracks, 
make sure to bring a spare battery because um, using your phone more, especially using GPX tracks, will drain your battery a lot faster than normal. Packing your bag is exciting because it means you have a hike on the horizon. Whether you choose to home base hike in the Lake District or walk from village to village, somewhere like the Scottish Highlands, you really can't go wrong. Just remember, I'm here to help you every step of the way. You can find me at explore-on-foot.com if you need help planning the British hiking vacation of your dreams. This is what I'm really passionate about. It's one of my favorite things to talk about, one of the reasons I'm happy to be on the show tonight. I really believe that together we can create a revolution of more authentic and immersive travel, one hike at a time. Thank you so much, Cass. That was absolutely fantastic. You know, your presentation made me realize the two things that make me feel most alive are travel and hiking. And I normally don't do them together, at least not very often. And that's a mistake. So yeah, it's you so really got to combine them. It makes, I mean, makes both of them better than they are separately. Yeah, absolutely. That makes perfect sense. Incredible. And I really enjoyed your packing tips and hiking tips as well. Uh, now, Gabe has prepared for me quite a list of questions. I'm sure you're excited for that. But before we get to those excellent questions, I would like to share tonight's word from our sponsor. And um, Cass, could you actually stop your screen share for me? I want people to sure. really get a big look. Thank you so much. A big look at tonight's product. We have a couple bags that I really enjoy here at Rick Steves Europe. And one of them is the Shavita Day Pack. So for the day hikes you mentioned, this could be a very good choice. This is what I would personally select. And I like it for a few reasons. First of all, it's very light. You see, it, it weighs almost nothing, I would say. It has a very soft material, but yet it holds quite a lot. And I can also say that Rick enjoys it quite a bit too, because this is his personal day pack. If you've seen Rick's videos through the years, this is the bag that Rick often has for his day trips. So not only for day hiking, but for your day-to-day -day travels in Europe. This is a great and inexpensive choice that you can find at ricksteves.com. I have to mention that um, I have also used that pack when I went on my big trip with Mac um, that started this whole thing. I brought that same pack with me and it was the one that I took on my day hikes and I still love it. Well, that's fantastic. What a great testimonial. Yeah, yeah, I love it too. It's one of the two of our bags that I really use a lot. All right, we have quite a few questions, I think, that uh, we can get to. The first comes from Susan and several others. Um, we have some viewers tonight who are wondering, do you recommend using hiking poles? Ooh, okay. So here are my real thoughts on hiking poles. They can be excellent for people who need them. So if you have creaky knees, you know, if you have a hard time going down steep slopes, I definitely recommend bringing hiking poles with you. Um, if you don't need hiking poles, don't bring them because they're actually bad for the trail surface. They break down the surface of the trail. So it means that the trail needs more maintenance over time. Um, but like I said, they're very helpful when you need them. Something that you need to think about with hiking poles is that you can't bring them on the plane. So unless you're going to check your bag or buy them in Europe, uh, it makes it kind of difficult. No, very good tips. And I didn't realize that actually about uh, trail conditions. That it has I know. Problem. Yeah. David is wondering if the trails tonight you shared are generally well marked. Yes. So one of my favorite things about hiking in Europe is that the trails tend to be very well signed. So this is true on the West Highland Way. This is also true in the Lake District. Um, something that's a little different than in the United States or Canada is that trails are usually signed for the place you're going. So it'll be like the next town or something like that. It won't really be you're on trail eight and, you know, the next thing is going to be in three miles. So it's very user friendly and there are a lot more signs than we see here, which is good because I particularly don't like getting lost. <laughs> Me neither. Me neither. Yeah. That's great. A few of our fellow travelers are curious about hiking in this region in winter. Do you think that's a decent idea or can, can you prepare for hiking in the rain? 
Yes, you can prepare for hiking in the rain, um, but I think there's a reason that most people hike March to October in this area. And even though the, these are low mountains, they still are mountains and there is some elevation. And um, in case there is snow, you would really, I think, want to be safe. And so I would stick to March through October. Okay, fair enough. Richard is curious how you find lodging for your hiking trips, or if you don't find any, do you just try camping? So in a lot of places in Europe, wild camping is not allowed. I like that they call it wild camping as if it's something that's um, completely out of the realm of normal. Um, but, you know, I've never had a problem finding accommodations. Sometimes you can run into a little bit of a problem if it's um, a village to village hike or a hut to hut hike something like the West Highland Way where there aren't a lot of places to stop along the way, um, you can run into trouble if you plan too late and you don't reserve your room. Um, but for the most part, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to get a place to stay as long as you're planning at least three to six months in advance. So I use booking.com for most of my stuff. I find it's a really easy to use platform that shows you everything you want to know about a, a property and allows you to compare between different properties in an area. So I use that for um, towns especially, but now when you get to smaller areas, really rural areas, that's when sometimes you need to either go to the trails website. Surprisingly enough, a lot of these trails have their own websites like the West Highland Way and um, Tour de Mont Blanc is another example of a trail with a website. And they'll list the accommodations on there and emails or phone numbers so that you can get in touch with them. If you're also having a hard time finding a place to stay, I highly suggest contacting the local tourism bureau because they can put you in touch with even mom and pop places that aren't listed on a major booking platform or that you can't find as easily, um, but that may also take in walkers. There are a lot more accommodations out there usually than you can even find online. Those are great tips. Thanks, Cass. Sure. Maybe you mentioned it before, but I don't quite recall. And I think maybe a few others may not. What GPS app do you recommend? Ooh, so my favorite is Gaia. I've used several different GPS apps, um, but I prefer Gaia because it's so intuitive and easy to use. Also, they have a free version and it can work for whether you have um, like an Apple iPhone or if you have a different kind of phone, like an Android. And basically with Gaia, even with the free version, you can upload a route and then set it to follow that route. And if you want to go with a paid version, then you can um, do a lot more fancy things. But Gaia is the one that I always choose when I'm hiking. Fantastic. I think I'll download it after the show, in fact. Yeah. And it's G-A-I-A, -A, Gaia. G-A-I-A. -A. Thank you. Marlene is curious if you think it's safe for single women to travel on long multi-day hikes. I love this question. Um, I don't feel safe walking, hiking by myself in the United States, but I feel very safe walking by myself in Europe. And I've done a lot of it. Um, part of that is because the culture just feels safer in general. Um, the other part of it is that on these trails, they're not super busy, but they're also not typically too remote. So you'll pass through several towns, you'll find other walkers, a lot of European walkers actually, a lot more Europeans than you'll find Americans or Canadians. But so you're never too far away from other people, which I find really comforting. Um, especially, <clears throat> excuse me, especially with routes like the West Highland Way, you'll kind of get into a hiking bubble because there are prescribed places to stop each night. So that means that you'll get to know those people who are stopping in that same town. You'll see them on trail the next day, you'll tend to leapfrog. And that's a really great safety net if you're a solo traveler, because there are people who will look out for you and you'll look out for them and you can have companionship when you want it, um, but you don't have to have companionship when you don't want it, so. Excellent. I've had that same experience regarding the safety of hiking in Europe solo, at least from, from my perspective. Yeah. Uh, how old should kids be before you take them on a hiking trip? What do you think? So <clears throat> my kids are two and four, and um, there are pluses and minuses to going when they're so small. <clears throat> so when they're small, 
like babies through um, young toddlers, it's actually kind of easy to take them with you. They may have a lot of needs, like they need to be fed a lot of snacks and stuff like that, but it's easy because you can just put them in your pack and you can walk your same pace. Where it gets more challenging is when you have an older child who's more like five through eight, who is too big to fit in a pack, but they're not big enough to actually walk all of those miles by themselves. So that's when you're kind of in the doldrums of being able to hike well with them. So I would say before, I would say like zero to three is definitely manageable. And then from four to about eight, you have to be really careful about the kind of trails you select. They say that kids should be able to walk a mile for every year old they are by themselves. So, I mean, we have my daughter up to walking five plus miles. Um, but one of the things that we do is we break that up. And so, you know, she doesn't hike all five miles all at once. So I would say you can really hike with kids of any age. It just, um, you have to make modifications based on how old your kids are. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, Cass. Yeah. We do have a question. Do you prefer village to village hiking or home base hiking? Oh, it's like trying to choose between my favorite children, right? Um, I love them both for different reasons. So village to village or hut to hut, experiencing a new place every day feels like a big challenge, right? And it's exciting. So it can be good if you're celebrating a big birthday or there's some type of milestone where you want a sense of accomplishment. Home base hiking is equally wonderful, but in a different way. It's a lot easier. So if you want a vacation that feels like a vacation, home base hiking can be the way to get it because you have fewer accommodations to book. You have fewer um, things to worry about along the way because you're, you're in one spot. And home base hiking is great because, you know, if you have young kids, especially, it may be the only way that you actually can explore Europe on foot. So I love them both. I actually do them both and I like to mix them. So um, especially when I'm by myself, I'll do hut to hut or village to village. As soon as my family is with me, we'll do home base hiking. And then we kind of go back and forth between the two. I would like to try village to village. I've never done that before. So that's what I think I'll do next. Uh, Susan is curious, what do you think are the best ways to treat those pesky hiking blisters? So the very best thing you can do is actually be extremely proactive about your blisters. So I don't know if any of you have seen those kooky socks. They're like the five finger Vibram kind of socks. And um, each of your toes has a separate little compartment to fit in. And those are wonderful. There's no way for your toes to actually rub on each other. And so when I was doing a lot of sand hiking in Portugal, they saved me because I was starting to get sensitive feet and I've done a lot of hiking. I do not have sensitive feet. I have like rough hiker feet. And uh, so they saved me from even starting to get blisters. But then the, the next thing that you should really do is as soon as anything begins to hurt, don't push through it. Stop immediately. Put on a Band-Aid, do something, put on some cream. Um, to treat it as soon as it starts to hurt. So it doesn't actually become a blister. Those are the, the top things that you can do because if you actually get to a blister, then what you're gonna need to do is pop it and treat it and hope that it doesn't hurt too bad the next day. Okay, early intervention, I got yes. it. I think your early last statement, <laughs> your last statement about what happens if you don't do that has convinced me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Someone in the Q&A mentioned a home base hiking book. Do you have a different yeah. book coming out? Is that coming out soon? I do, yeah. So my manuscript is actually due in uh, two months. So I'm trying to finish all of that up and it will come out in the fall of 2024. And it's a whole book on home base hiking. So it'll teach everybody about that kind of travel. So, you know, why it's a good idea, how to choose a good home base. It was, it's actually a lot more challenging than you would think, because if you type something like home base hiking into Google, it'll give you pretty much predominantly Alpine experiences. Um, but I wanted to offer people more than that. So it's what I spent, you know, three months hiking this last summer. And I have trails that are um, on the ocean. I have trails that are 
in wine country. I have trails that are in the Alps, kind of a broad um, swath of Europe. And so it'll highlight 10 of those destinations with write-ups on all of the hikes in those areas that I recommend. That is fantastic. And thanks to Kathleen in the Q&A for, for bringing that up. Well, congratulations. I'm looking forward to seeing that book too. Thanks. Now, I actually have a personal question. I was in Finland for quite a long time uh, in 2022. And in June, uh, I had the worst mosquito experience I've ever had before. I mean, absolutely <laughs> awful. The weather was great, but those mosquitoes, far worse than anything I've ever had here in Washington, kept me from some of the walks and hikes I wanted to do. And so I'm just curious, how do you manage these bugs? So it's very rare that I've had a big bug experience like that, but it does happen sometimes. Like I think of one particular time I was hiking in Switzerland and there were these horrible biting black flies. And it was like a three day stretch of just fly central. Um, and at that time I didn't have any bug spray with me that would fight flies because I mean, here I was in the Swiss Alps. Um, so what I do now is even if I'm, no matter when I'm hiking, I always bring a bottle of bug spray with me. Um, it doesn't matter if there is a 0% chance of bugs. I always hike with bug spray. And so I don't like the deep stuff. It breaks down your gear. It's also bad for your skin. I just choose kind of an eco-friendly uh, spray like Badger. And then I try to cover up as much as possible too and just spray it on exposed areas. But I will say that, um, yeah, it's pretty rare to have an attack of bugs, but when it happens, it tends to be epic. Well, that's great. I'm glad it's rare. Yeah. Because <laughs> it was terrible in my case. Yeah. Um, we have time for just one more question. Deanna is wondering, what is your personal favorite hike in Britain and Ireland that we dis that we discussed tonight? Oh, my very favorite. I would have to say the Lake District. Um, I'm a sucker for tea and coziness and fires and uh, just kind of being out in the rainy day, but then, you know, being inside at night and being extremely cozy. And I like those small villages. And like I mentioned in the presentation, I really like the inns that are right outside of the villages. So whenever I go to Britain, that tends to be my go-to. I really like the Lake District a lot. It sounds fantastic and it really looks beautiful. So I can understand why you picked that one. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Cassandra. It's been a great pleasure to have you on Monday Night Travel for your second time tonight. We've really enjoyed it and I feel deeply, deeply inspired. Would you come back again? Oh, I'd love to. I'm glad. I think we will look forward to having you back. And what it's the beginning of 2023. Do you have any hiking plans in Europe this year? Well, right now, since I'm trying to finish this new book, I'm kind of homebound, which is hard. It's like the research of being a trail author is amazing. And then you come home and you're like, oh, I have to sit at my desk and do work. So that's on tap. But um, actually, one of the next big things that we're going to do is I'm going to write a book on exploring Europe on foot with kids. That was some inspiration from this past summer. Um, and then after that, I want to move to Bavaria for a year. We're aiming for between uh, probably two to three years from now. We're going to live there for a year so I can write a book on hiking in Bavaria specifically. So Amazing. Wow. Well, I'm excited for that. Maybe you can tune in. This is the great thing about Zoom. You should tune in from uh, Bavaria. Maybe that'll be the next show. Right. And then I'll have some sausages and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll go with the tea, maybe. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, Cassandra. Good luck. And uh, I'll look, I think the rest of us as well, will look out for your forthcoming book. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, Ben. And to all of our fellow travelers tonight, thank you for joining us. I really hope you enjoyed everything Cassandra shared. And uh, please tune in next week. We have a great show. We're very excited to return to a destination duel. So thanks so much again and have a great night. Good night, Cassandra. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Ben. Good night, everybody.